Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Living Works Faith, Suicide Prevention for Faith Communities Everywhere. We're going to share experiences and ideas in a multi-denominational context, outlining meaningful actions you can take to help save lives. And above all, we're very excited to be officially launching the Living Works Faith Online Suicide Prevention Training Program. Now today's webinar will be recorded and we're going to send the link via email so you can review it later or share it with a colleague. And we're going to be taking questions through the chat window. A Q&A session is going to happen at the end of today's session. And to minimize background noise, we do ask that you please keep your microphones muted. We'd also like to know who's on the call today. So feel free to drop us a line in the chat box telling us where you're calling in from and what denomination you're with. My name is Michelle Skierman, and I work in communications at Living Works. I'm going to be your moderator for today. On the panel, we also have Glenn Bloomstrom. Glenn is the Director of Faith Community Engagement at Living Works and one of the driving forces behind the development of the Living Works Faith Program. Glenn is a retired Army chaplain and an adjunct professor of pastoral counseling at Bethlehem Seminary in Minneapolis. Glenn worships in the Baptist Church. Also on the panel today, we have Chaplain John Morris, a United Methodist pastor and a retired Army colonel. And Reverend Amy Fondroy Ike is a rostered Lutheran pastor serving different ELCA churches in the Twin Cities area. So just a quick overview of today's agenda. We're going to tell you a little bit about Living Works and the organization, our vision for suicide prevention, some of the challenges we face in this field, some of the statistics are alarming, but there's five actions you can take today to help make a difference. We're going to have panelist insights, of course, from Chaplain Morris and Reverend Amy Fondroy Ike. And we're going to announce our Living Works Faith Program, take a little bit of a deeper dive into there. Um, we do want you to um, ask us questions today and after the program to learn more about Living Works Faith. And we'll have our Q&A discussion right at the end. So we're going to jump right in and uh, Glenn Bloomstrom is going to give us a little bit of a perspective. Some of you on the call may not know about Living Works, the organization. So Glenn, I'm going to hand it over to you to tell us a little bit about Living Works. Thanks, Michelle. We're really excited to have all of you here. I can't see the chat box, but I can see it popping at the bottom of the screen. It's just so nice. Thank you for introducing yourself and and telling us what denomination you represent today. So for those of you that don't know Living Works, uh, Living Works Education, Living Works, the company, we are world leaders in suicide prevention training. Our specialty has been uh, really suicide intervention training. And we have several programs. Uh, our, our hallmark program that we're known as is the Applied Suicide Intervention Skill Training or ASSIST. This is a two-day standardized training. Uh, we also have a half-day training program, Living Works Safe Talk. And then we have a very fairly new program called Living Works Start, which is a 90-minute fully online program. Now, all of our programs are designed for a general audience. They don't really focus on a particular demographic per se, but we are really the standard for crisis line workers worldwide, and especially in North America. Uh, the ASSIST training has the most rigorous research on outcome and effectiveness, both for those that are trained, their level of confidence and satisfaction, and believe it or not, They've done research with crisis line workers and interviewed those who had an intervention on the crisis line and what they preferred and liked about their crisis line worker. We also have lots of training in schools, among the military and as an army chaplain, I was introduced to Living Works in 1999 when I was in charge of suicide prevention education for all the army chaplaincy and well, the rest is history. So it's in all of our service components and used in many international militaries as well with police and many, many more unique settings. Um, 
I should say that Living Works is not a faith-based organization, but we have many people of faith who have a strong commitment in, uh, in our team and within the company. And so they are willing and want to enter into a specific demographic training with Living Works Faith. Thank you, Glenn. And so we are announcing Living Works Faith today. As I mentioned, you've been the driving force behind it. It's been years in the making. Tell us a little bit about the vision for Living Works Faith. Well, the vision for Living Works Faith, really, when I was hired by the company, I've always had this belief that the faith community could be empowered to save lives from suicide. And since uh, 2012, I've talked to literally hundreds perhaps even thousands of those trainers and participants who come from a faith background who would love to see the quality of Living Works programs developed and implemented in churches and faith communities. So that's our vision. More faith communities empowered and joining in national and state efforts to reduce suicide deaths. And so Glenn, tell us a little bit uh, about you know, some of the challenges and the statistics and why these skills are so needed. Well, as we know, uh, worldwide suicide is a leading cause of death. And in North America, we've seen, as in other countries, a consistent increase in suicide deaths and suicide attempts. I believe that within cultures, there is more and more conversation and the belief that suicide is an acceptable thing, but it is uh, extremely impactful on families and on those left behind. It is the second leading cause of death among youth. Uh, and we point out youth, but we all know that military veterans, those that our GLBTQ, we have certain populations that are higher, but really we could point out a number of populations, uh, rural communities, agricultural communities, and middle-aged males in North America. So for each person that dies, 136 are impacted, and many have an increased chance of death from suicide themselves. So we really want to make an impact in that. Those of us that are in suicide prevention, you know, at, at community, local, state, and national levels. And we believe that the faith community can be the reinforcements that are needed. So we know that some studies say that up to 34 or 84% of clergy have been approached during their careers, as well as other studies point that 25% of people will speak to their pastor or their clergy person or faith leader first before discussing mental health challenges. Yet, most ministry leaders are unprepared when it comes to suicide. We know that roughly six, uh, six out of 10 have no training. And many, many more faith communities also, because of this lack of training and awareness, struggle with stigma. Now, what is that stigma? Well, stigma is the internal sense of shame when there's been a suicide behavior or suicide death or the external perception of really of having failed in some respect. There's one study that said up to 80% of people in their churches and faith communities leave because of the perception of being a failure, of, of, of just disappointing their friends in the faith community or internally blaming themselves. So stigma is a huge thing that we believe that leaders can definitely address. So such a, an opportunity here for faith communities to help. So let's get specific, Glenn. What can uh, faith communities and ministry leaders do to respond to this challenge? Well. Research shows, we know clearly, hundreds of studies show the benefits of active participation in one's faith and religious practices. You know, but as I mentioned before, why skills are needed 
is within those communities, often there's much silence about suicide and mental health. But yet in faith communities and churches, we have more volunteers than all organizations combined because people of faith believe in caring for the neighbor. And so why wouldn't it make sense that this neighbor care worldview, regardless of our denomination, why, why wouldn't it make sense that we understand the dynamics of suicide, know how to make an intervention and integrate our efforts with those outside of the faith community. You see, there's this invisible wall. Many people in nonprofits and outside of the church and faith communities don't know how to get in. And those within churches and faith communities, another aspect of stigma, if a person were a very good Christian, quote unquote, they wouldn't have thoughts of suicide or wouldn't have mental illness. So we know that's just such a, 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 a misperception of both of these areas. So we want to do more integration between those outside and with those inside and those inside to recognize that suicide is a part of being human. And Glenn, did you want to tell us a little bit more about the role for ministry leaders? Well, you know, it all cannot rest upon a ministry leader, a pastor, a priest, or a rabbi, or an imam for that matter. But leaders lead with courage and conviction. Right now, the predominating attitude for many faith leaders is suicide prevention is not my role. I'm not trained for this. Yet, as I mentioned before, studies indicate that people will give invitations. All our programs speak of this. Invitations hoping that someone will catch that in from in, in invitation and ask about suicide. So again, it makes much sense that ministry leaders at all levels of the church and faith community are trained and alert to suicide. So if they're better prepared, better understanding the dynamics of stigma and how they can help inside and outside, then they can empower their people to be involved and to be trained and also to build alliances to work together. That is so important working together. Let's talk a little bit more about how the, uh, the communities you know, can help. And I believe you've got five points that you'd like to emphasize for our audience today. Even if they don't um, you know, ever check out Living Works Faith, you've got right. some things they could do today to help. Right, exactly. You know, most of us have three points in a poem in a sermon. So I hope I don't sound really sermony here, but really if we were to to boil down what we're really hoping that'll come out of our conversation today really are these five actions that faith leaders will assemble, mobilize, and empower natural helpers. Who are natural helpers? Again, it's neighbors. It's people that are not necessarily mental health providers or professionals. It's barbers, stylists, coaches, teachers, you know, Sunday school and Sabbath school teachers, it's youth leaders, it's people from a wide variety that have relationship with others, that leaders will lead and accept suicide prevention as something that's a part of their role and that is something that exists within the church and faith community, that leaders will equip themselves with training and knowledge of resources in order to allow those people that they assemble and mobilize and empower to go out and do this important aspect of ministry, to recognize that, um, that um, you know, there are many resources outside of, of, the, um, of the church uh, that, can be, uh, that can be mobilized and connected with, and then also to talk about most of all to listen and integrate suicide prevention into their ministry contexts. 
Thank you so much, uh, Glenn. Those are such important points that everyone can take with them today. So we're going to hear from our panelists now to see how they've actually been able to integrate some of these principles into their careers, their communities, and in fact, entire organizations. Chaplain John Morris has a long and varied chaplaincy career with the US Army. He retired as a Colonel serving at the Pentagon. He's currently the Executive Director of Military and Veterans Services at Bethel University. John has a wealth of experience in building leadership and support for suicide prevention initiatives. And John is also featured in our Living Works Faith program. So welcome, John. Well, thank you, Michelle and Glenn. Thanks for that uh, great overview that you gave. I echo everything and say amen to everything that you said and welcome to everybody on the line. I know you're busy professionals, but uh, your presence here today is critical and your interest is going to be well rewarded here as you uh, dive into what's being offered. I came to uh, this area of interest because I grew up with a mother who attempted to take her life several times. And I watched the impact of mental illness and I experienced it in our family. And uh, as a young adult went to a local a faith leader and asked for help for my family. And that person fumbled, not because they were ill-intentioned, but uh, they just didn't know what to do. And we were left in tremendous distress. As a member of the clergy, uh, my first week as a parish pastor in a rural community, a parishioner came to me and said, I need your help. My neighbors lost uh, his farm and I'm worried. I didn't understand any of what was being said. I wasn't from a rural background, didn't know the emotional impact of losing a farm, but I heard in the fear of that parishioner's voice that something bad was going to happen. Really what the parishioner was saying is, I'm afraid my neighbor's gonna take his life and I don't know what to do, but I'm sure you do as a member of the clergy. Uh, I can't say that I was super well equipped by my seminary education, but I knew enough from my personal upbringing, I needed to be present and I got involved in that family's life. From that became a passion for being present with people at critical moments in their life, and I'm sure you're the same as I am. What happened to me as an Army chaplain is I found this great tool called ASSIST, which put language and technique towards what I had a passion for. And I became an evangelist for assist with every chaplain and religious affairs specialist I worked with and every commander I worked with because it was a tool that empowered people to do something that's seemingly simple and that is be present for somebody in turmoil, but it's not simple and you know that. It gives courage to step forward and to ask a tough question of somebody in tremendous emotional turmoil. And it reduces the isolation that so many people who are suicidal feel because it empowers us to enter into their lives and to offer the comfort that a, a friend with some knowledge can offer at a terrible time. I'd say this to summarize everything that we've talked about thus far in my own experience. A commander asked me once late at night if I would come and talk to one of his soldiers. I spent a good portion of that night really just sitting in a vehicle out in a field listening to this person pour out their soul. Didn't think a lot about what we were doing, just knew that it was important for this person to have somebody to talk to. Uh, left that engagement, told the commander what I had done. Um, didn't think a lot about it until about two months later when I ran into this soldier. I had spent the evening with them, but never saw their face. It was that dark. And the soldier said, do you remember me? And I said, you know, I remember spending the evening together, but I got to tell you, it's fun to meet you because I didn't get to see your face. He said, well, I'm alive today because you sat with me. I fully intended to take my life that night. I was shocked. I hadn't been assist trained at that point. I didn't know what questions to ask. I had learned to listen through my clergy training, but I had I just breathed a prayer of thanksgiving that God overrode my inexperience. And I would say to you, grab all the training you can get because you'll have many, many opportunities to use it and you'll be able to offer a life-saving opportunity to people who are 
generally open if somebody will ask them and will take the help if somebody will offer. So I'm thankful to Living Works. I'm thankful to my buddy, Glenn Bloomstrom, who's done so much to make this tool available. And I'm thankful for an opportunity to share my story with you. I hope it's helpful. Thank you, John. Can we um, ask you a few questions? Uh, we've still got some time left. I'd love to talk a little bit about leadership uh, for suicide prevention. Sometimes it does take courage. Um, and, you know, within an organization like the Army, for someone to step up and say, you know, this is important and we need to do something organization wide. So, can you talk a little bit about your leadership, both at the military installations where you served, but also outside of that in the greater community? Well, I think, uh, yes, it, it takes a little bit of courage to stand up and say we need to address this, an issue that has some stigma around it, mental health. But I think if you start with the baseline, everybody has somebody in their family struggling with mental health issues. You're not far off and you can move off of uh, inaction to action. I found in my local church, I worked with Stevens ministers, parish nurses, they quickly resonated and wanted to receive some sort of training. And from that, they were able to help me educate church councils. Really, I didn't experience a lot of pushback. What I got from people was, why is it taking so long for us to talk about this? And everybody had a story they wanted to share of somebody that they loved and knew who needed help. When I got into uh, military ministry, uh, even the most hardened combat veteran commanders and senior enlisted want to take care of their personnel and their families and want to get at the root of the issues so that they can help these people get back to being part of our formation. So it wasn't hard to... Uh, to present the idea, what was hard is to find time to train against all the competing demands. And for me, it, it just took patience. It took, uh, unfortunately, increasing number of incidents across the Army to get the attention of the people that control training calendars and persistence, not being a nag, but uh, being an advocate for hurting family members and military members. And ultimately, every commander added suicide prevention training to their to their uh, training calendar. And then great trainers like Glenn came in and got us off and running, and it took off from there. So when a suicide happens in a large organization, certainly there's a ripple effect. It can be quite devastating. Um, and we've talked a little bit, you know, about the prevention side of things. What about the aftercare? How do you care for people after an event like that? Well, Michelle. I probably have the sad distinction of being the only, being the person in the army who was uh, very close to the highest ranking officer to take their lives. I had a commander who was a major general, two-star general who changed command and within a week had taken his life. So I will tell you that uh, at that point in time in the army, we didn't handle that very well. The stigma of a senior officer taking their life, huge. Last time we had seen that was when the uh, Chief of Naval Operations had taken his life in the, in the early 80s. We don't know how to handle that when a senior leader, a junior soldier, we have a well-defined ritual, tremendous things that we do to support everybody. Senior officer, we went into total depth silence, which was terrible. So what I ended up doing is spending a lot of quiet time going office by office, house by house to senior leaders to comfort them, to hear their shock, to deal with their pain. Um, but institutionally, we, we fumbled that horribly. So we often, all of us, I think, have, um, you know, retrospect about things, you know, if I had known then what I know now, do you have any reflections on that, John? Well, I'll tell you what I tried to do, and I would try to do it again, is I tried to call other chaplains to come and help. I needed people from the outside to come so that we could flood our organization with trained people that Glenn and others had trained to come in and just do what assist teaches you to do. I was immediately worried about follow on suicides. I was worried about people who were on the edge. And all of that, we didn't have any follow on suicides, thank God, but people on the edge surfaced very quickly. And it was beyond what our behavioral mental health team 
and the chaplains in our organization can handle. If I had had my way, which I offered to do is we would have had a senior leader and spouse retreat and we would have gone away for a weekend and we would have processed this together very quickly and learned how to grieve together, how to share our powerful emotions and set a new baseline on how we're gonna do life together. What I called it is we need a be human moment. Take our ranks off, sit down and deal with this as human beings. We're not impervious to this. We just couldn't find a way to get that done, unfortunately, but that's what I would have done. Okay, thank you so much, John. We really uh, appreciated that. That was enlightening. We're gonna come back to you at the mm -hmm. end with uh, some questions from our guests. We're going to turn things over now to Reverend Amy Fondroy Ike. Um, Amy has a background in family therapy. She attended the Luther Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota. She's currently serving churches by providing pastoral care and support. She ministers and supports others in their ministry around the issue of suicide. And Amy is also featured in the Living Works Faith Program. Hello, Amy. Thank you so much for being here. And I've, I've just loved watching the chats and noticing the number of people joining in. Um, there's been so much good information that's already been shared. And I that all of you feel encouraged and supported as you step out and care for those impacted by suicidal desperation. So Amy, can you share with us some of your experiences um, regarding suicide perhaps within your congregation? Yeah, so I'm going to share with you uh, the first time it hit me that I was so ill-equipped to care for someone who was experiencing suicidal desperation. A man came walking down the hallway and I didn't recognize him at first because he was a bit dis disheveled. And I'd only met him and his young wife a few times on a Sunday morning. I welcomed him into my office. And as he came into the office, I realized he was also intoxicated. This young man was part of law enforcement and moments before had almost ended his life. Now I knew to love him. I knew that he needed to let his family members know what was going on. And I knew he needed more help, but I didn't know where to turn. 911 didn't seem like the right place, especially because he was law enforcement and he seemed safe at the moment that I could see him face to face. So I didn't feel like 911 was the right place to turn. Um, thankfully, he did get some help. He went through another time when he was feeling um, suicidal and came uh, to the church. And I will share with you the first time he came to the church, his wife and his mom both ended up in the office with me. and. All three of them openly said this was the last place, the church was the last place they expected him to be because he wasn't very, um, wasn't a deep church person. And they really believed it was the work of the Holy Spirit that brought him there that morning. But I was ill-equipped to help him. I'm glad to tell you, I still keep in touch with him. He's doing well and has two young children and um, is so thankful um, for God's work in his life. So I, the question had been posed to me, has my attitude towards suicide changed? And I thought back and realized that actually um, loving those who die of suicide was part of how I ra was raised. I grew up on a farm and a neighbor when I was really young um, died of suicide. And my parents were some of the first people over to the farmhouse. And my parents were the ones, excuse me, asked to continue to put flowers on the grave years and years later after the wife and children moved to another community because it was just too hard to live in that hometown. Um, so I, I was thankful to have been blessed to be raised to love someone struggling with suicide. So I want to tell you that 
even though I had counseling and psychology and social work and art therapy, all my background, even though I served as an in-home family therapist, even though I went through seminary, no one gave me, besides asking, do you have a plan to gauge how serious someone is? No one gave me guidance. I don't remember a single person telling me about a suicide awareness organization or suicide awareness trainings. I would echo John, please go out and get trainings. Please take the time. This is an amazing opportunity that Living Works is putting together with Living Works Faith. But if you can take assist, which I have taken that training, and I've done several other trainings with other suicide awareness organizations, postvention, prevention, and suicide awareness, I can't get enough. So please, anytime you have an opportunity, take trainings and find out about suicide awareness organizations because you truly need all of those resources. Because suicide doesn't know silos. Suicide doesn't know denominational lines and boundaries. Suicide doesn't know professional boundaries. Suicide is like a bomb that hits the middle of the community. And when that bomb hits, those closest are impacted and oftentimes die, and the ripple effects go farther than you can even know or understand. I had three young boys in my house, a 16-year-old, a 13-year-old, and a 10-year-old. When my 16-year-old was in middle school, a sixth grade girl died of suicide in the school building. There were kids who were still there at the building when first responders came. The family didn't wanna name it as suicide. So the school, out of respect for the family, did not name it as suicide, nor did they provide any suicide awareness information in the page long list of resources for parents to use for kids who were struggling with this death. I begged them, bury it, bury suicide awareness information in another list and email it out later in the week. They made another email of information and they, they were very caring around this death of this young person, but they didn't name it as suicide. Clergy and the community came together. They were worried about the kids and others who were impacted, but they felt like their hands were tied because they felt like they couldn't name it as suicide because the school didn't name it as suicide. So they called me in and I met with the pastors and provide them with resources and I utilized some of the information I had pulled from some of the resources that I had that said, when a death happens, oftentimes the conversation of suicide comes up. And because the conversation of suicide comes up, blank, 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 I'm, I'm opening this door. So I equipped them to have the conversation because people were talking about it. Um, that next, in three months, a high schooler in that same community died of suicide. Six months later, I worked with Glenn um, Bloomstrom on a planning committee. We worked with two other suicide awareness organizations to bring suicide awareness to a neighboring community, not the community where these suicides had happened, but a neighboring community. A speaker, um, well, first of all, it was funded by suicide awareness organizations, by the churches, and by the foundation of the community. Prescott Foundation put money towards the speaker and put money towards um, 10 people in the community, didn't matter who, to attend a day long, the next day's day long training. Also, the Prescott Foundation paid for substitute teachers so teachers could attend. So a second grade teacher and a sixth grade teacher from the Catholic school system attended the day long training because of this Prescott Foundation um, funding. So I share that little story with you because communities are hungry for good conversation. There was a presentation with the middle school, public and Catholic together, presentation with the high school, there's not a Catholic high school in the town. And there was an evening presentation just with the teachers closed door so they get to say things like, there were sixth graders who didn't know that suicide meant someone dying, even though in Bug's Life, a cartoon most children have watched, it, they say the word suicide. And there's many other references to suicide in young children's books um, and, and other things, the word suicide. 
Then that evening was an open um, presentation that was created off of Safe Talk. I have that correct, right, Glenn? It's called Safe Talk. Okay, thank you for nodding, Glenn, because I'm sometimes I don't get the titles of different suicide awareness um, talks correct. And then the next day was a day long training. It was thorough and people attended a variety. That evening community conversation, 75% of the people came from out of town. Prescott is a very small town that sits just across the border in Wisconsin. It is not a destination town. So for 75% of the people to be coming from other communities, they came just because of the conversation around suicide. And when I took flyers around, yes, I took flyers around, um, it was the youth who right away would say, yes, I'll post this in the workplace bulletin board. Yes, put it up on our bulletin board over here. Or I get cold calls from youth who would say, I saw this flyer, can I get more flyers and put them up? Youth are hungry to have conversations around suicide. I share those two stories with you um, because I want you to know that suicide is not a silo um, situation, but even suicide awareness organizations can have a hard time knowing about each other and coming together. So faith leaders who work within a community can be the leaders to say, it doesn't matter what our backgrounds are, we can all love and care for those who are, who are experiencing suicidal desperation. And a lot of suicidal desperation um, wrestles with what Glenn talked about is the stigmas that are around faith questions. Where was God? Is this a sin? Is a person gonna go to hell? Will they be allowed to, to have a church service? And those are, are questions that people are asking now in the year 2020. This isn't 1950 or 1930 or the 1900s. They are asking those questions now. And if churches don't A, know what they believe, and B, know what other denominations believe and that we work together to care for those who are experiencing suicidal desperation, then those stigmas are just gonna continue. Um, I wanna share a little bit about natural helpers. A good neighbor who's one of those natural helpers and leaders. And Michelle, you have to interrupt me if I'm going to- yeah, Amy, we're gonna hold it there. Okay. We're gonna come back to natural helpers in our um, Q and A session at the end. So thank you so much. You've become such an amazing local and regional community champion and, and you've done amazing things mobilizing those natural helpers. So um, I think we're gonna move on now. We're gonna bring Glenn back and we're gonna talk a little bit about the Living Works Faith Program. Glenn, can you give us kind of a high level look? It's my pleasure. Um, so the Living Works Faith program um, really uh, focuses on, it's, it's a five to six hour online training program for Christian ministry leaders. Now I say Christian and this initial um, offering of Living Works Faith is designed for Christians. Uh, it was reviewed by a rabbi I have many friends who are from other denominations, but my, my peer chaplains and others in this work agreed that if we tried to bring it all together, it would not fit for any. So it's a self-paced online training. It covers all three aspects of suicide prevention, intervention, and postvention. And so that's different than what Living Works has always focused on. We've focused primarily on intervention, but now we're looking specifically at prevention and postvention, what we do after suicide behaviors in the context of the church. It is interactive. We have a learner's guide that can be uh, printed and written in, or that can be typed into because it is an interactive program. We're not telling people what to believe. The most beautiful part is you've heard from John and Amy. We interviewed about 15 different people, uh, clergy from a wide breadth of backgrounds and denominations who tell their stories of their first experiences with, with suicide, being trained, not being trained, funerals, how they take care of themselves, a variety of things. 
as well as suicide survivors, those who have lost loved ones. We've interviewed a therapist. We have a suicidologist who's interviewed in this. The whole program is designed to really reduce anxiety and help leaders be prepared to lead in their traditional functions and to lead others in their faith communities to become involved. So in the next slide, we, we talk about them. Here's, here's a quick overview of the modules. I'll just highlight a few of them. Module two is, well, module one is just the structure and how we're really focusing on the learner's needs and experiences. In module two, the con uh, understanding suicide in the context of faith, basically how attitudes, theology, and culture informs our pastoral response to suicide. Now, I wanna really stress here that this is very consistent with all of our programs. If we don't understand our attitudes, and for faith leaders and people of faith, how our faith informs our attitudes. It really can affect our ability to lead and to make an intervention. Next, with the role of faith leaders, we talk about and reflect on the role to provide suicide care, including boundaries and self-care. Uh, our next module is Promoting life. Well, that's the prevention module. Promote life is a, a precept in living works. And it's really talking about promoting life and safety from suicide. And here in the context of the church, we're talking about with integrating it in, in a natural fashion into teaching, preaching, and building resources for your specific community. Intervene, learning foundational skills. And here we use our Living Work Start program, which is almost like the CPR level of training. We believe, though, and you've heard both John and Amy speak, that a pastor should be trained at the highest level, at the assist level. But we show the most basic CPR level using Start, which is very interactive. Oh, it's just, I love to show this program because it's such a beautiful online program. So that's module five, intervene, provide support after a loss, funerals, memorials, and what to do initially and long-term. And then finally, we have like a, a scenario that has questions and answers and avatars that a learner can interact with to put their learning into practice. And then of course, a conclusion, resources, and references. So that's basically a high overview of the program. And finally, I'll let you read these. I don't need to reread these, but, but we're really wanting, you know, in case you haven't heard it yet, for ministry leaders to see that suicide prevention is part of their role, for them to examine their attitudes and for them to lead the congregation in examining their attitudes and theology in responding to people with thoughts of suicide or those who are suffering because of the impact of suicide behaviors. We teach skills. It's all about building confidence and it's also about networking in communities outside of the faith community. So I love that last line too, inspiring others. That's what faith leaders do. And of course, we'd love to talk about that and we're going to have another webinar coming up where we're going to show a pastor that has inspired others just like Amy has through implementing what we call the network of safety within a large suburban church. It doesn't have to be a large church. It can be even, even a network of churches in a rural area. Thank you, Glenn. So we've covered a lot of material today and we know that you likely have questions. So we hope to get to some of them today. You can just jot it down in the chat window. Um, but if we don't get to your question, we'd love for you to send us an email. Um, we're happy to follow up one-on-one -on -one with you. So you can email us at faith at livingworks.net. So I am going to um, move over to my 
chat window here and see if I've got some questions coming in. And I do have one. Um, I think this one is directed to Glenn. Uh, a few people have asked where Living Works Faith falls in terms of cultural and values discussions taking place in the faith community currently. Can you tell us more about that, Glenn? Well, you know, that question really has a lot to do. That person obviously <laughs> is understands how broad the uh, Christian faith community is, that there is a spectrum of people on both, you know, across the continuum. And, you know, so we've had developers who were suicidologists. We had developers who came from a more progressive background. And we had developers and people that spoke into the content that come from a more conservative background. We had researchers who did qualitative research with clergy, again, and chaplains from a very diverse background. But really what we're trying to do with this training specifically is to highlight and to focus on suicide. That instead of talking and highlighting the things that divide us and accentuating the things that divide us, we want to keep the focus on suicide. That goes really so much back to my chaplaincy background. There were chaplains from a wide variety of denominations. And how we work together is we understood those differences and we were able to work around the things we shared in common and focus on caring for soldiers and families. You know, whether one baptized children or baptized adults, those things did not divide us. And so our hope, really our prayer, is to accentuate the fact that suicide is everyone's business and that we come from our, our camps and we now join a new camp, a new tribe that believes that suicide prevention is important within the church and faith community. Michelle, I, I, can I just add to that? Yes, Amy. Um, I just cannot say enough how Glenn has treated me as an ELCA um, what female pastor with respect and has been a team member. So I know that he, he has created um, Living Works Faith with the same kind of respect for denomination or theological or um, political differences. Thank so you, wonderful Amy. to hear. Yeah, Thank I have you. no doubt about that. A few, uh, few more questions coming in. Glenn, do you have to be a Living Works trainer to access the program? And uh, how much does it cost? Absolutely not. Uh, well, our, our vision, our hope is that this, um, this training can be integrated into continuing education, professional development, that it would be a class in a pastoral counseling course in a graduate seminary or in a ministry preparation um, um, curricula. So you do not need to be a Living Works trainer because this is all online. Now we, we hope and we think, and, and I think as the program unfolds, there'll be opportunities for dialogue and facilitation in spite of the fact that it is completely online. And we're encouraging that people will go once COVID, we're safe from COVID, we'll attend face-to-face -face training, which you must be trained in order to be able to do the other Living Works programs, except for START, because START is all online. Uh, this is a Christian program. What about other faiths? Yes, indeed. Uh, so I mentioned that this was uh, reviewed by several in the suicide prevention community, including my friend, Dan Roberts, who's a rabbi. And he told me, oh, Glenn, we can make that uh, Jewish, no problem. But what we need to find are those champions from other faiths and sponsors who can help us to do the same kind of narrative approach with interviews with faith leaders before they were prepared and why preparation makes a big difference. And to speak into rituals and uh, belief systems that support 
these, this horrible uh, stigma that isolates people and causes them to leave their faith communities. So that's down the, down the road. We selected Christianity because again, it is the majority faith, but I'm ready to talk to people once we get the bugs worked out and, and we're all set, you know, then I think we'll be able to go to the next uh, phases of the programming for specific faith groups. Glenn, when will Living Works Faith be available? <laughs> well, you saw on the slide, it will be available, available no later than the 26th of October. So a little over a month away, but I'm really hoping it'll be available sooner than that. So just keep an eye on the Living Works website, www.livingworks.net. And you'll see a, uh, probably a part there for faith. Um, when you do online programs are very complicated. And because we're integrating Living Works Start with Living Works Faith, we're, we're facing some challenges we think we're very, very close. And Glenn, how much does it cost? All right, right now the cost is $149.95. So that's what we're looking at. And if you think about that, so Living Works Start has a $30 um, fee. Uh, right now for COVID-19, it's 20. And um, you know, we're, we're willing and considering bundling uh, some of our Living Works faith with a number of Living Works Start programs. So if you're part of a large denomination or organization, please talk to us, you know, and we're willing to work with you. But these programs are not inexpensive to develop and uh, that's uh, where we're at. We think that's a pretty reasonable price for six hours. We'll also undoubtedly have CEUs uh, for those that require them. Glenn, someone here is asking, so you mentioned that the program is theologically based, unlike some other faith trainings that are more yes. generic. Yes. Can you talk a bit about how the training engages with theology? All right, that's a great question. And so we look at all the, all the mentions of suicide in the scriptures. We look at church history and how certain perspectives within the mother church so to speak, came about with, um, with um, Augustine and Thomas Aquinas. And we also look at how that theology um, supported a lot of legal positions that really created um, the stigma that exists today. And look at the history of, you know, the prohibition of stigma and how that influenced people getting help and people talking to others for help. Now, theologically, again, I want to underscore, we are not telling people how to believe, but we're asking them to reflect on their own theology of suffering, their own theology of suicide and how they can be with a person who is thinking of suicide in a respectful, secure and safe way. And, and not allow our attitudes or our own theological beliefs, which may be different from the person we're speaking to, to get in the way of compassion and help and an effective intervention. That is something that Living Works has stressed for decades. You'll find there is no telling people how to think and how to believe. So because it's Christian, we can then examine those passages in the scripture, we can ask the kinds of questions and ask the learner to do higher levels of reflection and application instead of telling people what to believe. As a seminary professor, I have lots of experiences of our seminarians occasionally, more than occasionally, wanting to be told what to believe. And we know that the best education challenges people to reflect and to articulate what they believe. Glenn, you mentioned the program becoming available later on in October, but you would love to have conversations with people ahead of the launch. How can they get a hold of you? Absolutely. Well, if you would just uh, respond to that uh, email that we had there, contact us. 
Uh, there's, there's people that are willing to, you know, interact with you. I will interact with you. So um, email us at faith at livingworks.net. Love to talk to you about your opportunities. If you look in the chat, there's many trainers. Um, there's trainers from a wide variety of worldviews and denominational perspectives. And we want you to know, we want to work with you. And uh, we will be, you know, down the road, but we're really launching right now. And I think that this opens up a lot of conversation for people. And that's very, very important in this early phase of mobilizing the faith community and churches. So we have just a couple of minutes left. Amy, I wanted to go back to you, your point about mobilizing natural helpers. What did you have to add there? Well, a couple of things. My understanding this, um, this time we've had together is going to be available online. When will that be available? So those who either had to leave early or came late or who want to hear it again or share with someone else, when can they access this? So I think we're going to be able to get this up online next week, early next week. Okay. Um, I'm actually going to skip to something else. And if we have time, I'll come back to natural helpers. Got about two, two minutes left or so. So Okay. Yeah. We're in October of 2020. There's a pandemic. March is when things shut down in our community. In May, we received an email that another high schooler died of suicide. Um, sometime shortly after that, I was watching the news and my 16 year old walked through and said, I don't know one person who has died of COVID or has gotten sick, but I know kids who have died of suicide and have died of drug, drug overdose. Who's talking about that? And where's all the money and funding towards suicide awareness? Um, we are a family who takes COVID seriously. So please know that but I was stunned by what my son had to say. A lot of times pastors hear or use the term pastoral emergency. And I had to rethink that. There's very few times when truly it's an emergency for me to be there. If it's an emergency, the 911 needs to show up or the doctor, but, but for suicide. Suicide's the one thing that truly is a pastoral emergency because it's a crisis of lack of hope and it's a crisis of feeling isolated. And that is a place where we can truly save lives. And you will have the honor, just like John shared, of someone telling you that they are alive today because you are willing to talk about suicide. We still have time. I can talk about natural helpers, but I wanted to share those two things. Thank you so much, Amy. I'm just going to check in with John and see if he had any final thoughts before we send people on their way. John, anything you'd like to add? And I think you Michelle, need to- Michelle, thanks. Yeah. I appreciate it. Glenn's offering us a tremendous lifeline and I'm excited to see the faith community coalesce around this at a time I think we have an epidemic of suicide that just continues to surge, makes coronavirus look like nothing. Uh, we need what Living Works is offering, and I hope you'll you'll join League with Glenn and his colleagues. Excellent. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who joined today. It was wonderful to see uh, people from all over Canada and the United States and elsewhere joining. So thank you for making time in your schedule. As Glenn mentioned, we will be having another webinar featuring a church where they actually established a very successful network of safety. We're pleased uh, to be hearing from Pastor David Troutman of Westwood Community Church and his church staff. So we'll really dig into that of how they were able to build a network of safety. And in the meantime, as we've mentioned, we would love to hear from you. Happy to answer any questions. We are standing by quite literally. Um, we'd like to help you explore further how Living Works Faith can help you in your ministry. So please email us at faith at livingworks.net to begin that conversation. So I think we will leave it there for today. Thank you so much, everyone.